Welcome to my message today as we talk about Assemble Your Army. This is part of a series we're doing right now called Anxious for Nothing. Anxious for Nothing. And so we are fighting back against anxiety. And to help us do that, uh, one of the things that we must have in our lives are mutually supportive relationships. And so I've entitled this message today, Assemble Your Army. Assemble Your Army. And so all the titles are geared towards the military uh, because I'm trying to get across to us the whole idea we are fighting back. We're, we're not just going to take anxiety. Uh, we are going to fight back. And so today we're going to talk about the fact that you don't do that alone. You, ha you have to have an army of people. You have to have relationships uh, with other people so you're not fighting alone. Don't fight alone. Fight with a team. Uh, fight with people in your life uh, that can mutually uh, have a relationship with you, and you can support them, and they can support you. And so today we're going to learn how to do that, how to assemble your army. And so as we're doing this, we're walking through... Philippians 4, 4 through 9, and the way I'm describing this are six verses. There's six verses. Now, listen, we're going deep with those verses. We're spending eight sermons on six verses. Uh, that gives you some idea of uh, how deep we're going into this uh, Bible passage. And the reason we're doing it, like I said, it's God's battle plan, all right? So it's six verses with six what I'm calling calming promises, calming promises promises that lead to one uh, wonderful promise. And here is the promise, Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, six verses with six calming steps with one wonderful promise, and that promise is the peace of God. So thank you for being here today. We welcome you to this sermon. And so today as we begin here, we need to remember uh, that Paul is writing this uh, from a Roman prison cell. He is in prison, soon to be literally beheaded. So just imagine, you know, you, you got things going on in your life. I got things going on in my life. There are things in my life causing me anxiety. I'm sure there are things in your life causing you anxiety. But think about what Paul was going through. I mean, he's in a dark uh, prison, uh, you know, he's in a difficult spot, and, and listen, it's soon to be time for his life to end uh, when the uh, Emperor Nero uh, has literally given orders uh, for Paul to be martyred and literally to be beheaded. And so in the midst of that, uh, this passage shares with us how God gave uh, Paul peace. So let's read it. Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Here the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And I'm trying to remind you every time, you know, don't miss that exclamation mark. I mean, he said this with great enthusiasm. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I love that. And then verse 5, Let your gentleness be made known to all men. That means stay level-headed. Why? The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. That's where we get the title uh, for our sermon series. And again, that word anxious means to be pulled apart, to be pulled in all kinds of different directions. That's what anxiety is, according to this passage. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be pulled apart in all kinds of different uh, directions, but rather in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate. Meditate on these things. And today's text, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will 
be with you. Don't miss that last part. The God of peace will be with you. Well, listen, for that to happen, you cannot live life alone. You, you have to build mutually supportive relationships. You have to have an army <laughs> of people, uh, and you're part of the army, and, and you have support for one another. So today, let's talk about how to do that. How do you assemble your army? Well, Paul is a great example for us to look at. I mean, he is an awesome example of uh, building relationships. And so today, as we begin, our key verse for today is Philippians 4, 9. And I just read it. I want to read it again and just elaborate on it a little bit. He says at the end of this passage about anxiety, he says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And what Paul is talking about here is the, the relationship that he had with them. And, and really he's emphasizing, you know, what I get out of this is, hey, I'm trying to be a good role model for you. I'm trying to be a good example uh, for you. We, we need examples, good examples in our lives. We need role models uh, in our lives. And he says to them, listen, you've learned from me, you've received from me, you've heard from me. Hey, you saw me. Uh, you saw the way I, I live for, for the Lord. And he says, do these things. In other words, I'm giving you a good example. Uh, follow uh, my example. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. And then he says, and the God of peace will be with you. So let's talk for a moment about Paul and specifically relationships. When you think about Paul, you know, it's important to understand, you know, he, he was a single man. He wasn't married, uh, just like the Lord Jesus, okay? Uh, but yet he understood the importance of having relationships in his life. And so Paul built many mutually supportive relationships. And I want to make sure you catch every word there, mutually supportive relationships. Okay, it's a two-way connection. You're mutually supporting each other. It's not one way, it's two-way. You know, you need people in your life that you're supporting them and they're supporting you, all right? Mutually supportive, not a one-way uh, direction. And you need these relationships, and, and Paul had it. In fact, uh, you know, he, he mentioned, listen to this, he mentioned over 100 people by name in his New Testament writings. I mean, if you go through and look at Paul's writings, uh, you know, in the books he wrote of the New Testament, he by name mentions over 100 people, over 100 people he mentions. And most of them, he did it in a fond way. In other words, I mean, there were some you know, he warned about them and said that they weren't, you know, good role models or they weren't doing the right things. But for the most part, he lifted up these people and, and he knew their names, he knew their situations, uh, he knew what was going on uh, with them. And, and really it just shows us, you know, that he was involved in people's lives. In fact, if you go to like the end book of Romans, Romans 16, if you look in Colossians 4, those are just two examples where he ends those letters with a long list of names, okay? In other words, he goes through and he mentions a bunch of different uh, people. And then secondly, Paul built his army of friends by being a friend. Paul built his army of friends by being a friend. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 24, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. So what's God's plan for friendship? Be a friend. If you, if you want to have friends, all right, you say, I want to have more friends in my life. Well, what does God say? God says you've got to be friendly, okay? You have to be uh, friendly. And, 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 and Paul practiced this. That, that Paul was a friend. He was a friend maker, all right? He built uh, relationships uh, with uh, people. And what we're going to look at today we're going to go back to the beginning of Philippians, and we're going to learn about three ways Paul showed himself to be friendly. So we're going to, we're going to go deeper here, but we're going to back it up to the beginning of the book, because I want you to see how did Paul build these relationships, and how does he teach us to build an army of relationships. So today we're going to go through Philippians 1, 3-11, but before we do that, 
I want to talk about anxiety thought number five. And so one of the special parts of this teaching series, the spiritual growth campaign, uh, is that we've been having an anxiety thought, an important thought uh, to help us. And here is the thought for today. Here it is. Listen, don't try to fix anxiety alone. Build a community of healthy, supportive relationships. Let me say that again. Don't try to fight anxiety alone. You know, the tendency sometimes uh, for some of us is when we get nervous and we get uh, overwhelmed by uh, worry and, and anxiety that we, listen, we isolate ourselves, right? We, we withdraw from relationships. That is literally like the worst thing you can possibly do for yourself. Okay, you don't try to fight anxiety by yourself. All right, what do you need to do? Build a community. Build a community of people in your life that provide healthy, supportive relationships. You know, you can't spend your life, you know, all the time with a bunch of toxic people. You got to find people that add health to your life that can support you. And by the way, you can support them. I, I, I think I've said it. I know I've said it. I want to just say it again. It's a two-way connection, all right? I'm supporting you. You're supporting me. And you can't do that for everybody, all right? Because you're just one person, right? Um, but listen, we can't do it for everybody, but everybody can do it. Meaning if we'll all build that type of community, uh, listen, it will be so helpful uh, to experience God's peace, and that's what we want. So let's look at Paul. Let's look at this guy, and, and really what we're talking about is some of his like people skills. And if you go back to the book of, uh, of Philippians at the beginning, and, and by the way, this is my favorite book of the Bible. I just love the book of Philippians. It's called the book of joy. And uh, I think 19 times, I believe it is, something like that, Paul uses the word joy or joyful or rejoice. And again, he's in a, he's a in a prison cell about to be beheaded. So that's pretty awesome that he could say rejoice in the midst of all that. But today, let's talk about these three ways Paul showed himself to be friendly. And it's found right here at the beginning of Philippians. The first thing is be positive about the good in people. If you're going to assemble an army of people and you're going to show yourself to be friendly, you have to be positive about the good in people. So I'm going to contrast unhealthy relationships and healthy relationships. Unhealthy relationships focus on the bad in people and ignore the good in people. Unhealthy relationships focus on the bad in people and ignore the good in people. In other words, uh, a lot of times what happens in relationships is people just see the negative, okay, uh, the negative. And um, you know, one thing I learned a long time ago is, you know, we as humans, we tend to judge uh, other people by what they do, but a lot of times we judge ourselves by what we intended to do, all right? Let me, let me dig a little deeper on that, okay? A lot of times what we do, we look at other people and we say, okay, you did this or you didn't do this, or, you know, we start criticizing, we start attacking them, all right? But in our own hearts for ourselves, we say, well, you know, I intended to do that, and, 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 you, and a lot of times we, you know, give ourselves a little grace. We need to give everybody grace. We need, we need to give everybody uh, some, some grace, all right? And, and realize, you know, that, that uh, you know, uh, there's good in everybody. And we need to recognize the good that people are doing. In fact, James 3 puts it this way, verses 9 and 10. He says, with, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude that means in the image of God. So it's talking about the tongue. If you know James chapter 3, it's talking about the tongue. And it's talking about the power of the tongue. And it's saying, you know, with one uh, part of our mouth, we're blessing God. And with another part of our mouths, we're cursing people. And I love verse 10. It says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. Now listen to this. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. These things ought not to be so. All right? we, we shouldn't be doing that, okay? We, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and, and unfortunately, if you get yourself in an unhealthy relationship, that, that's what you can expect. Rather, healthy relationships choose to focus on the good in people. 
Healthy relationships choose to focus on the good in people. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 1, 3-5. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, I love verse number three, okay? I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You know, I, I've said that uh, and written that, you know, many times through the years, okay? I think it's such a special thing to say to people. You know, every time I think of you, I thank God for you. And he talks about out of his thinking, he's praying for them. He, you know, he, you know, uh, you know, he, he's, he's got them in his mind, but he's also got them uh, in his prayers. And we're going to talk about that more on the third point today. And he's talking here about the fellowship, all right? And that's the key word I want to focus on. They had fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He's talking about their fellowship. He's talking about the relationship that he had with them. Now, what's important to understand is he's being positive about the good in people. You see, the reality is when he was in Philippi, where he's writing to, he had a lot of bad stuff happen there. <laughs> I mean, if you go back and look at it, I mean, I mean he, he went through a lot of stuff uh, in Philippi, including going to prison. You know, yeah, he's in, he's in prison in Rome as he writes uh, this book here, okay? Uh, but when he went to Philippi earlier, they put him in prison there too. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, and they beat him, the Bible says. They, they, they lashed him. They, they, they hurt him. I mean, he had all kinds of mean and cruel things happen uh, to him. And he could have just focused on that and just remembered, you know, when I was in Philippi, man, you know, people there were so bad to me and, and stuff. No, he says, you know what, I thank God for you. And the reason he's thanking God is because there was also uh, people like a, a, a wealthy businesswoman named Lydia who came to accept Christ there. Uh, he's thinking about a, a demon-possessed slave girl that, uh, that was freed of a demon possession and came to know Christ. He's thinking about the jailer. Remember the jailer when Paul was in jail? The, the, you know, the, the God literally shook the jailhouse, if you will. And, and the doors were opened, and, and the result was the, the, the jailer and his whole family came to know Jesus. See, when he's saying, I'm thanking God for you, I'm remembering you, he's not remembering uh, you know, the bad, he's remembering the good. And, and listen, if you show yourself friendly that way, guess what? You, you're going to gain some supportive relationships, all right? Because we all need this. We, we, we all need people that see the positive what we're doing and not the negative and always being critical and, and tearing us uh, down. And, and so part of assembling your army is to be that kind of person. You know, people want to be around people like this that are positive about the good that's going on. You know, catch people doing good things and tell them. And don't always be catching people doing stuff wrong and criticizing uh, them. Number two, be patient with the growth in people. Be patient with the growth in people. Again, contrasting unhealthy relationships and healthy relationships. Another way we can show ourselves to be friendly, that Paul showed himself to be friendly, was he was patient with the growth in people. But in unhealthy relationships, they criticize people for how far they have to go rather than praise people for how far they have come. I want you to let that sink in. Uh, in unhealthy relationships, all right, you know, people just, they, they literally can't do enough, all right? They, I mean, anything they do is not good enough, all right? And, and, and the health, unhealthy relationships, they criticize people for, you know, how far they've got to go, and, and they ignore how far they've come, you know? They, they ignore the fact that, hey, we're all in progress, okay? We're, you know, we're all a work in progress. And the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 2, let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. And I love that verse because I know we're not supposed to be praising ourselves. We're not supposed to be bragging on ourselves. Okay, that's, that's wrong. But listen, what's right is we ought to be praising each other. Let another man praise you and, and not your own mouth. In other words, we're, we're to be you know, lifting each other up and praising one another. But in unhealthy relationships, 
they don't work that way. Okay? There's, there's constant criticism about what not is getting done. And then healthy relationships, this is what you want. Healthy relationships praise people for the growth in their lives, for the growth in their lives. Plus, they recognize that everyone is still, in quotes here, under construction. We're all under construction. We're all a work in progress. None of us are perfect, all right? None of us are perfect. And Paul recognized that in Philippians 1, 6 through 8, when he says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And I love that verse. And every time I see that verse, I think about my pastor. That was, that was his life verse, Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is working in us. God is helping us. God is improving us. All right, And we could be, should be confident about that. But again, none of us have totally arrived. And he went on to say, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Man, these words just bleed, <laughs> bleed uh, with love and bleed with support. And, and he's saying, listen, I know you all haven't totally arrived. I get it. But I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you. God is doing a good work in you. And he's going to keep doing that work until the day of Jesus Christ. And he's telling them, I love you. I have you in my heart. You know, he's talking about the, the relationship they had and, and that they were all in the grace of God. Okay, we're, we're all the work of grace. I mean, you know, Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe, 15, 10, I am what I am because of the grace of God. I am what I am because of the grace of God. I mean, there's no room for us to be uh, bragging on ourselves. We, we are what we are because of God's grace. And he says, I long for you all. I, I want to be with you all. I miss you all. I mean, he's talking about relationship here. And he's talking specifically about, you know, being patient with their growth and, and realizing that, that they're on their way. You see, you got to distinguish between salvation and the Bible doctrine of sanctification. So when it comes to salvation, this is the work that God does for us, all right? We cannot save ourselves, right? Salvation, you say, what, what does save mean? Save from what? Save from hell. So if you want to go to heaven, which I'm sure you do, at least I would think you would, okay? I, I certainly do. In fact, I know I'm going to heaven because of Jesus, not because of any of my good works, but because of my faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross for me. And, and through that, uh, I gained forgiveness uh, from him. And, and we got to understand that's salvation. This is the work God, God does for us. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You can't earn it. It's a gift. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so salvation is the work God does uh, for us. But then, please understand this. This is an important doctrine. It's called sanctification. And this is the work that God does in us. So when, when Paul said, you know, God's begun a good work in you, he's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And what that means is when you stand before Christ, you know, we'll be with him in perfection. We'll be with him in heaven, all right? And we won't be dealing with this sin thing uh, any longer, okay? Uh, and, but until that time, you, are, you and I are in a constant state uh, of growth, in a constant state of getting better and trying to improve ourselves. It says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. God, this is God's will, and the context is about sexual sin, which is not what I'm preaching on today, so I'm not going to emphasize that, but, but he's saying the application is to abstain from sexual immorality. 
And he goes on to say that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So the context is, okay, sexual sin, and he's dealing with that, but the, what he's really saying is, okay, God wants you to grow, okay? You, you keep falling into the sexual sin, and he saw that as a spiritual growth issue. He says you got, you got to grow past that uh, in, in your life. Listen, be patient with the growth in people. people. We're all a work in progress, okay? We're all a work in progress. None of us have arrived, all right? None of us have arrived. And a way you can show yourself to be friendly to people, okay, and build mutually supportive relationships is to express that and, 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 and to, to relate to people that way. So the first two things was be positive about the good in people, be patient with the growth in people. And then the third thing is be prayerful for the needs in people. Be prayerful for the needs in people. So one of the most wonderful things you can do to show yourself to be friendly is to pray for someone. And not just say you're praying and then maybe not praying, but to truly pray, to truly pray for someone. I mean, to truly pray for someone, that is one of the greatest ways you can show yourself to be friendly. Because in unhealthy relationships, here's what happened. In unhealthy relationships, people talk uh, you know, to people about people rather than talk to God about people. In unhealthy relationships, people talk to people about people. That's called gossip. Rather than talk to God about people. People. I mean, honestly, if we spend more time talk, talking to God about people, we'd get a whole lot further down the road, right? The Bible says, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you, okay? So God expects us even, even to pray for our enemies, right? And maybe someone you're criticizing right now, they're, they, they, they could even be an enemy, all right? But God still wants us to pray. And if he wants us to pray for our enemies, how much more does he want to pray uh, for those that are special uh, in our lives. But again, in unhealthy relationships, you get in unhealthy relationships, you know, there's going to be gossip and complaining and all that. Hey, let's talk to God. Let's talk to God. And then healthy relationships pray specifically for people. Now, I love this, all right? Paul says, I've got a prayer list for you all. I've got a prayer list for you all. And, uh, and the thing I want to point out about this prayer list is the emphasis on the spiritual. So it's important to pray for physical things, all right? You know, pray for illness, pray for sickness, pray for disease, all that stuff, okay? We, it's an honor and a privilege to pray for the sick, and we should pray for the sick. But the emphasis here, and quite frankly, the emphasis in the Bible uh, is to pray for the spiritual needs of people. And I love what Paul listed here, okay? Just imagine having someone praying for you for these four things. What a friend. What a friend. And here's his list. Number one, he says to them, I'm praying that you'll grow in love. I'm praying that you'll grow in love. He says in Philippians 1.9, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. Let me read that again. And this I pray. He's saying, okay, I'm pray- he's saying, I'm praying for you guys, all right? Remember in Philippians 1.3, he says, you know, I'm, 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 I'm remembering you and I'm, I'm lifting up prayer for you, all right? And then he goes a step further and says, okay, this is what I'm praying for you about. I'm praying that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. He's saying, I'm praying your love will grow. And, and I'm sure that's talking about, you know, uh, Paul is talking about, you know, loving God more, loving one another more. Oh, my goodness, this, the world needs this so much right now. There's so much hatred in the world. And, and we need to pray that we will abound in love and that we will love one another and that we would pray for each other, that we would love. Pray for people to grow in love. And by the way, as you're doing that, pray for yourself that, we'll grow, that you'll grow in love. Number two, pray that you'll make wise decisions. Boy, decisions are important, aren't they? Decisions you make turn around and make you. Decisions you make turn around and make you. And he says, I'm praying that you may approve the things that are excellent. And that word approve is the idea of 
of making decisions. As you're, as you're going through life and you're, you're approving things, that means you're deciding on things, okay? He's saying as you're approving things, as you're deciding on things, I'm praying that you'll make excellent, excellent decisions. That's something to pray about, right? Because again, you know, how did you get where you are in life, all right? Here's how I got where I am in life. Decisions. Decisions I made, but also decisions sometimes people made on my behalf or whatever. Or I was, I was, I was the result of their decision. And sometimes that was good, sometimes that was bad. And sometimes I've made good and sometimes I've made bad decisions. But I am where I am today in my life because of decisions in my life. And so you, you need to pray. Pray that people will make wise decisions. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to have a friend like that that would pray every day that you'd make wise decisions? And then number three, pray, that, uh, pray they will do the right things. Pray they will do the right things. It's easy to do the wrong thing, right? <laughs> There's so much temptation out here, so, so much against us. He says that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That you may be sincere and without offense. Without offense means right, doing, doing the right thing until the day of Christ. I'm, he says, I'm praying for you all that you'll do the right thing. I'm praying you'll do the right thing. Wow, what a wonderful prayer. And then... Pray they will live for God's glory. Pray they will live for God's glory. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. He says, I'm praying you'll be filled with the fruits of righteousness. He's saying, I'm praying you'll keep doing the right thing, but then you'll have the right motive for doing the right thing. He says, I'm praying you do the right thing, but I'm praying you'll do it for the right motive. And the motive is the glory and praise of God of God. Do you see where it's going here? He's telling them, listen, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I mean, this is the type of friends we need, okay? Friends that will pray for us, that will talk to God, not talk about us, but talk to God uh, about us. I mean, is there any wonder Paul named over a hundred people in his writings? He had all kinds of these healthy relationships in his life. And the reason he had them was he was positive about the good in people. He saw the good in people and, 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 and recognized that. He, he saw the growth in people and he was patient with people and he realized that, hey, you know, we, we're all a work in progress. And listen, he was prayerful for the needs in people. I, I pray that I would be that kind of friend. I pray I would be that kind of friend. And, and, and I, I pray you would be that kind of friend. Because you know what? This world needs these types of mutually supported relationships. There's so many unhealthy, toxic relationships in this world. And we need exactly what this passage teaches us. Hey, assemble your army. Assemble your army. Again, our anxiety thought for today. Don't try to fight anxiety alone. Build a community of healthy, supportive relationships. Listen, where are you at right now? Maybe right now you're anxious, and I get it, I get it. I have the same, uh, you know, circumstance. Sometimes when I get anxious, I mean, I, mean, I just want to withdraw, you know. I, I don't want anything to do with people, okay. <laughs> I get that. And I'm not saying there's times you might, might need to be alone a little bit, okay. But don't stay alone, okay. Don't, don't stay alone. You, you, you need people in your life. And some of you, what you got to do is you got to say, okay, I'm going to build some relationships. I'm going to build some relationships in, in, in my life. And, 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 and church is a wonderful place to make that happen, okay, to build relationships. And again, they need to be uh, mutually supported. It's not just one way, it's two way. I'm going to support you and you're going to support me. We're stronger together. So today as we close as we talk about assemble your army, there's a prayer that I'm praying uh, each and every uh, time for the sermons in this series. Eight times, I'm going to pray this prayer over you and over me. And here's the prayer. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a beautiful prayer. Now may the God of hope, by the way, hey, 
Paul is praying this prayer. This was another prayer he prayed okay, to the church at Rome. All right, Think about that. He's praying for them too. He didn't just pray for Philippi. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.